the the coupling that I typically like to see is when the man is a spender and when the woman is a saver. Because I think that that typically, not all the time, but that typically works for the for the dynamic of the relationship where, you know, as a woman, I never want to be in a situation where, you know, a man is telling me, I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that and da 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 But I love it when he says, I want to spoil you. And I'm like, okay, great, but let's 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 think about this like i so now i get to appreciate the the gesture and the effort and i get to be the helper that says okay but what else could we be doing with this money i'm not gonna make no friends with this one it's all good we use it because as because i don't know how we got to this place where everything has to be bought your hair has to be bought the eyelashes have to be bought. The nails have to be bought. These are things that literally grow out of your body. <laughs> but that's not good enough. The version that we're born with isn't good enough. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we can see the ways that is detrimental to our mental health. We can see the ways that it could be detrimental to future generations of women and of young girls and boys. We can see how it could be detrimental. We can see how people are using our insecurities to profit. But there's something about being stuck in a cycle. It's that cognitive dissonance that will have you defend your right to be insecure. What's up, Bravehearts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of It's Scary to Read Mary, wanting you to love fearlessly. We are having the, the conversation about money, <laughs> right? I know a lot of people don't like talking about this, but I brought on one of my favorite finance coaches. One day I was on YouTube and I, I stumbled across her video. Uh, it just popped up on, on my timeline. And from that day forward, I was hooked. Uh, love the content. So this is a big one for me. I know you are in for a treat as well. Today, uh, she helps working professionals finally crack the code to six-figure wealth. I love that. Brave Arts community, let's show some love to Tasha K. How are you doing this evening? I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I love the work that you're doing. I got to say that. So it is especially heartening. And so I'm really excited to be here. Oh, for sure. Yes, yeah, so we're going to discuss finances and some of these videos that you did. I was looking at some of these <laughs> topics. I was like, she went there. Uh, I even did a reaction. I to say that. <laughs> yeah. And we have to talk about these things. There was a one. We're going to jump into it. But I did a reaction video to it. And of course, you know, people going to be people. And I want some of the uh, Brave Hearts community and those who are watching and listening, leave a comment below. Would love to hear what you have to say on uh, this topic dealing with money. First of all, I want to jump into this because I want to honor your time. What was your childhood like and what made you become a finance coach? Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. So I feel like that should say a lot. Like that kind of sets a certain type of stage. I'm from the Wild Hunnets. If you know, you know. And uh, I grew up in a very poor community, one of the poorest counties in the United States on the south side of Chicago in the hood. And I had a ball. You know, people act like the hood is like, you know, the worst thing ever. But there are so many positives and benefits of growing up in the hood. You walk outside, your best friends are there. Your cousins are there. Family is all around. You can walk into your neighbor's house like that's your auntie. You go to your friend's house. That's your second mom. Like the community is untouched. However... I definitely experienced poverty. And so from a very young age, I decided that there were two things that I needed to focus on. This is when I was five. I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. It seems like education is important for me to be able to have more freedom in the future. That's when I was five. When I was 10, I was like, mm, I think I'm gonna need some money too. 
And that at 10 years old, that is when I started creating financial systems. Um, so when I look at the things that helped me to get to where I am today, it was absolutely reading, having mentors, and just really being focused and taking accountability, even as a young person, for my own destiny. Wow. You took accountability as a kid. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, by today's standards, that's almost like a curse word. You know, you talk about accountability. You know, and I remember the day. I remember the day I decided to take accountability. I was in preschool mm -hmm. and uh, my mom was picking up my report card. She had came. It was report card pickup day. And I was so excited because I've always been an overachiever. I'm like, she about to look at these A's. And my teacher pulled her to the side and she was like, um, excuse me, Miss Marshall, can I talk to you for a second? And I heard the teacher telling my mom that I had too many absences and that if I continue, that I was going to fall behind. And I was just like, oh, no, not on my watch. Like, Tasha's not falling behind. Behind is a word that doesn't relate to me. And so I was like, you know, I guess I'll have to make sure I start getting to school every day. And I could have been like, you know, well, it's my mom's responsibility. She has to do this. She has to do that. But I'm like, if she don't, who's going to suffer? Me. And that was the day I decided to be accountable for myself. Wow. You said that as a kid. There's most adults that, <laughs> that can't say that today. They really do be like that today, don't it? Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to jump into this. I wanted to talk about the video you did, The Dark Side of Black Girl Luxury. Okay. What inspired you to discuss that topic? Black women are overworked, underpaid, and often underappreciated. And what I see is that we prop up every major industry. When I look at what happened in the natural hair community where Black women were going on YouTube and starting this huge movement, and then what happened was these big companies came and co-opted, took their formulas, took their ideas, and started making money off of it. I really started to, started to get sickened by how people profit from our ideas and from our consumerism. And I'm like, what's not clicking? Like something isn't clicking. And they are, we're bastardizing this idea of luxury and bastardizing this idea of a soft life and then allowing people who would oppress us to use it against us. And I wasn't okay with that. And that's what prompted me. And also, you know, I see people going to war over this on social media. And I was like, okay, let me talk about this with some nuance and grace and understanding. Yes, for sure. Because there were some things that you said, you said comfort, convenience, and authenticity. Uh, Black women looking for rest, relaxation, and ease, uh, which is uh, it, looking from the title, you would imagine like, uh-oh, the dark side of black girl luxury. But when you take when you take a different perspective on it with that, I was like, oh, that's really good. Like you said, overworked. Uh, I, I mean, I only can imagine because even with my wife, like we have three kids here and the two of them have autism. And I mean, we just trying to make it work. She working, I'm working. We, you know, she got doctor's appointments set up and all these other things. We got to clean the house, mop the floors. And so there's so much that go into it with taking care of kids. And like you said, overwork. So uh, I'm glad you took that approach. There was a, a quote that you said, the way black women spend their money determines the rise and fall of entire industries. Can you talk about that a little bit? Black women and black people in general, like we buy stuff. We buying lotion, we're buying hair care products, we're buying cleaning products. A lot of people don't. So they have entire departments around what are black women spending their money on? They have entire reports 
around what are Black women spending their money on? And they are co-opting Black women ways of being, black the ways that Black women talk, just co-opting it as a marketing opportunity to market to Black women and get more of their money. And I thought it was important to look at both sides of the spectrum here because when we talk about Black girl luxury, we have to talk about the fact fact that Black women deserve luxury or that Black women deserve to experience the things that they choose to experience. Um, but then the other part of the conversation has to be in what ways is it to our benefit or to our detriment? Because it's not as if these things are beneficial or detrimental in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's more about how are these things being weaponized against our bank accounts? The things that we have already worked so hard to build up black women, especially we worked hard to have the education and have the debt to prove it. Mm. Right. And then now we're going, you know, they've already gotten us on this side of things where we are, we have already spent a lot on the education that is not paying us the dividends that we expected it to, but we've already worked so hard. And now we have this sense that we deserve to be able to enjoy our lives. And we're in this soft season that's costing us a lot of money. And I want people to know that when it comes to luxury, who gets to define that? And I want us to reclaim our ability to define it for ourselves instead of allowing others to do it for us. Mm. Yeah, because when I think of luxury, I'm I'm thinking the, just the first thing, just unconsciously, I'm thinking uh, the trip to you know Aruba or or the the expensive car or the 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 super big house and there's only one person living in it that's what I'm thinking luxury I'm thinking the 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 purse and the shoes and uh and even with men too because I know you pointed out too you said about you know this is just not a woman's thing but <clears throat> but men too with the Jordans and stuff like that because men you know and and I've been guilty of it right uh, got the shoe collection Shoe collection, the ridiculous. Cologne collection. Cologne, yeah, I, I'm guilty. I got all of it, right? Um, <laughs> so I know what you're talking about. I, I get it totally. Um, I wanted to, there was a, you have so much great content. You talked about the seven Black American habits keeping you poor. Uh, I think I watched that video like three or four times. And I want to quickly kind of go over the seven. You don't have to go over them in detail, but I just kind of want to name them. You said not having a budget. You uh -huh. said you said distrust financial institutions. I thought that was great. We don't talk about that, right? Uh, you talked about FOMO and YOLO and keeping up with the Joneses. I'm gonna put a pin right here. Did you okay. see that? Did you see this movie called Keeping Up with the Joneses? A it, long time ago. Yeah, when they kind of like ran this test to kind of see if everybody would emulate what the neighbor like what the neighbor brought in into the neighborhood actually i don't think i did see that okay, okay. yeah it's it's maybe probably came out in like 2005 it's an older movie but I put, put a note here to take a look at it yes and it was basically an experiment to see if everyone else in the neighborhood would try to copy what this one company they bought this family to come in and have the the nice car and all the latest stuff and slowly but surely they started to change the neighborhood because everybody was seeing what this one couple was doing so it was an experiment um and that's how it is for us people don't know a lot of these people that you see on youtube that look like everyday people they are you think that Bobby, whatever her name is, girl, is the industry plant. It is the random people on YouTube that look like normal everyday people or the people who are on TikTok. Their whole purpose is to get you to buy and to try to keep up with somebody else. But you thinking they just a normal, regular, regular person. No. And in the same way with that, you know, companies used to have commercials and they're like, oh, Social media is the new thing now. So now we're going to put our informants on social media and have them get your money that way. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I had to talk to my daughter about that not too long ago. I was telling her about all these celebrities and stuff that the stuff that they get for free. And here it is. You're trying to break your neck to look like, um, you know, you fill in the blank. I'm not going to say any names, but, you know, um, and that was a shock to her. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah. 
So we really have to show our kids what's behind the veil. Um, and also I know for me, who my parents were, my parents were just like, I'm like, oh, they be they had that come out of me quickly because they were just like, you know, you're not here to be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You're here to be like you. And if I was like, oh, can I get this? The question is, but why? Why do you want it? And if it's like because so and so has it, they're like, that what that got to do with you? What does that have to do with what you want? And I'm so grateful that they did that to me because at the time it was like, you know, my parents are punishing me. I've gotten good grades. How come I can't have this, that, and the other? But what it instilled in me is a huge sense of self. And now, you know, when I'm looking at what are the things that I want, it has very little, not nothing, but very little to do with what everybody else is doing. And I can kind of you know, move through the noise and do the things that really align with the desires of my heart and with who I really am. Mm, that's good. Yeah, we have to teach our kids that because a lot of times, and I know I'm guilty of it, you always want your kids to have more than what you had, but then it's like, at what cost? You know? Mm -hmm. And what is more? They can have, mm -hmm. you know, what more future options? Um, you know, redefining. That's why we really have to start redefining a lot of these things. What does it mean to have more? Because we would be so much better off because there is so much richness available to us, but we're just looking in the wrong direction because that's where somebody dangled a carrot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I once heard a man say, you never know what you have until you go over your neighbor's house. Okay, you never knew you needed that thing that you didn't really need and they never use. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I wanted to continue on these seven because I kind of okay, okay. got into rabbit trails. It's all good, though. I love the conversation. You talked about financial ignorance. That's a huge one. Uh, grooming. Oh, can we stick a pin there real quick? Can you talk about grooming, please? Just for a little bit. So... I'm not going to make no friends with this one. It's all good. We'll use it because as a Because I don't know how we got to this place where everything has to be bought. Your hair has to be bought. The eyelashes have to be bought. The nails have to be bought. These are things that literally grow out of your body. <laughs> but that's not good enough. The version that we're born with isn't good enough. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we can see the ways that is detrimental to our mental health. We can see the ways that it could be detrimental to future generations of women and of young girls and boys. We can see how it could be detrimental. We can see how people are using our insecurities to profit, but there's something about being stuck in a cycle. It's that cognitive dissonance that will have you defend your right to be insecure, that will have you defend your right to be oppressed in a way. And you don't really want to deal with that because there's something very gratifying about being able to do that thing, being able to get your hair done, being able to get your nails done, you know, being able to do all of that. And then we say that it's self-care when, where is the self? If it's self-care, you do your nails, you know, do it yourself, <laughs> you know, like that's maintenance. So, and maintenance is fine, but don't pretend that it's self-care. When you're doing self-care, you are, you know, there's some touching, there's some loving on yourself that's involved in that process, you know, like, when you're when you're doing skin to skin with yourself, there is some self love that's happening in that process that doesn't happen when you're just sitting in a chair, disconnected from everything, not talking to the person who's doing your hair, kind of just on your phone. And a lot of times it feels like a chore and people know it, but they don't want to say it. Going to get your nails, it feels like a chore. The one thing I do, like I, I have a beard and I'm going to get this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my beard waxed. Like that's just going to happen. Sometimes, not right now, my eyebrows are real bushy. But when I'm really like, when I'm wanting to be cute, I go get my eyebrows done. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we can't do things to, you know, make ourselves look better or enhance ourselves. But I'm just saying when you get to the place where it has to be 
done and you're willing to spend money that you don't have on it, then that's when I think that we should really start to reconsider how important those things are to us and why that is and be honest about what could be underlying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah, I, I didn't, I never knew like hair and nails was so expensive. I had no idea. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is real, real. <laughs> People are spending hundreds of dollars on their nails and, you know, and it's not my thing. Like there are things that I, everybody has their thing. Yeah. So it's not a matter of, you know, shaming people who want to get there, except lashes. I will shame you for that. I'm going to shame you for your lashes. Like, okay. <laughs> but I'm just joking. Like, you know, everybody has their thing. The But the question is, what is your bank account able to handle at this time? You know, just because it's something that we want to do doesn't mean that it's something that we ab- were able to do. And it's certainly not something that we have to do and able to be in order to be our highest, most authentic versions of ourselves. And that's the part that I really want to drill down on. Yes. And like you said, what does your bank account say? Most people bank accounts say uh, natural, just be natural. <laughs> Oh, most people's bank accounts are saying, please be natural, please, right? And I think I'm like, okay, but you have, the, the assets are not there because like when I when I have all the assets I want, there will be clues. And right now I don't have them and there are clues. <laughs> there, you can see like the eyebrows are bushy today, like, you know, but also I I was raised to love myself. I don't, I, I had a mom who was just, you know, she loved herself and pe- men loved her and she never gave me any indication that it was because of anything that she had to do to herself in order to love herself or in order to be desired by others. And so I just look around like, you know, I mean, it is what it is and you get what you get and I love who I am and you're going to either like it or leave it. That's just what it is. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, because there's nothing. I mean, I just love natural beauty. I mean, makeup and and hair and nails. I get it. I, I'm 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 cool with that. But natural beauty is like undefeated. I hear men say that all the time, and when I'm gonna uh, challenge you on it because this is what I hear women say too. Okay. So men will be like, you know, we love natural beauty, but then when we out. We don't really see the men going for the natural women. So what would you say to that? Mm. Yeah, this is a whole conversation. I don't want to get too off track, but I, I will say that uh, when I met my wife, I, I met her on Instagram. Right. So, of course, I've seen all the pictures and stuff, but just seeing her like natural, like just in the bed, you know, <laughs> a, a bonnet on, you know what I'm saying? just beautiful like if we if we go hang out and she don't have on any makeup um you know if we just hanging out she got on some sweats and a t-shirt i don't know whatever i like she's just naturally beautiful you know mm-hmm. so and i think it it, it varies from man to man because some men be capping they talk that and then you know oh she was she was looking busted and all sort of stuff i'm like no if you like natural beauty uh that's what you like I feel you because I'm the same way. Like when I'm looking at people, I like to see them raw. Now, not beat down, broke down. Right, like, right. But just like, you know, like how you look like a real person. And I really resonate and connect with that. Now, I don't know, like some people may need to hear that and to have that confidence in order to be their real, raw, authentic selves. And then some people are just like, you know, I want to be made up. And if that's, you know, if that's your thing, that's your thing. But what we're looking at is, what is the bank account able to support right now? Natural. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for sure. Uh, and it's just my vibe. Yeah. Oh, no. I, hey, I, I would rather have some money saved in account than me looking fly and broke. And that's my thing. I'd be like, I like my money. I'm like, y'all don't like money for real. <laughs> y'all don't really like money. Because I don't like giving my money away because you're absolutely right. Like part of the reason I have a natural buy because I like my money in my in the bank. <laughs> that's part of the reason. I know that's right. Yeah, that grooming piece, that's that's probably an episode that you could do. Uh, <laughs> and have them come for me and have them come for me. 
<laughs> I will. I'll send them your way. I'll be like, <laughs> no, but I, I'm I'm with you on that. And then the next one you said expensive habits. Ooh, that was crazy. I was like, wow. You talked about the hookah and weed I'm and guilty. alcohol. <laughs> I'd be going out, you know, a hookah is $50. Really? In Atlanta, you in Atlanta, you got a hookah, that's $50. Ooh. So if you do that once a week, that's $200 a week. You get some drinks mm -hmm. on top of that. You, you, and that's like, yeah. So depending on what your habits are, it'll run away with you before you realize it. Wow. Yeah. And then I also, I also garden. So that's an expensive hobby, buying all these seeds, buying the pots, buying all the different things that I need to be a gardener. Then I produce one little lettuce, you know, like I harvested two green beans today. Like, okay, you could break. I can't even feed my family with two green beans. I can't even feed myself. <laughs> one person like what I'm, I'm just i'm just waiting for the rest of the green beans to come in <laughs> oh my god yeah that's it oh expensive hat because i know for me i love me personally i love like marketing uh with, with running this youtube and running this business running the coaching i i will spend some money on marketing um and i think that's my thing i'm just like ooh, okay this in the budget oh I done probably went over on the budget a couple of times or knowing I went over the budget a couple of times, just spending money on marketing and, and just so much stuff that go YouTube. But the way that you're talking about it is like, so if you're spending money on marketing, the way that you're talking about it has, it does have it sound like a habit, but it should be like, okay, but what is the ROI from that? That's the conversation. That's the, that's the part that moves it out of, I'm just toying around. So, okay what is this investment actually doing for me? That is very true. And that's a conversation Ooh, <laughs> we can have offline. Always something, always, always, always direction to go in. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Uh, and then you talked about giving money away. Woo! You said the black tax. Ooh. <laughs> There was, I was reading, uh, I think it was on in Forbes. It was either Forbes or Psychology Today. I can't remember off the top of my head. But they talked about how Black people are the most responsible uh, for their families when it comes to money. Like, we will go broke, broke, trying to make sure that we help our family to make sure that everybody's good. And I don't mind helping family. But I need you to help yourself, too, because I I can't go home just trying to help you, you know. Um, so that was something else that I thought was was really interesting as well. You have any thoughts on giving money away? That one is very hard for black people. Other races of people won't think twice about it. They are. um a lot of other communities, they do have this intergenerationalness that is very different from how it is in Black families. Like, they will literally be in one household. But in the Black community, it's not even specific to Black family, Black friends, Black church community, uh, Black kids in the neighborhood. I remember when I was younger, we would all go have breakfast at one person's house in the neighborhood, and then we would all walk to school. Now, I have breakfast at home, but a lot of people, if they didn't have breakfast, she's like, who needs to eat? You just raise your hand. We put sausages and eggs on the stove. Yeah. Who needs to eat? Don't none of them kids belong to her, you know? Yeah, yeah. But so it's that type of giving. You go to church and the church needs something, the people in the church need something, they taking up an offering for something, everybody coming up off their money. And uh, you know, this is very beneficial and necessary, but it's also like you said, you know, but what are we doing to help ourselves? And the way that I think about it is, number one, it's a beautiful part of our culture where we're so willing to give. But the other side of that is we have to have some follow-ups in place. Like my thing is, okay, the first time you ask me for something, I'll give it to you. The second time I need to see your budget mm. because I need to know how I'm going to make sure you don't come to me again, because that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. That is not workable for me. Another thing I do, I have a family pot. Okay, this is how much money the family pot has in it. When some money is there, you can borrow it. 
You can pay it back if you can. Don't pay it back if you can't. Mm. When somebody else needs some money, you know, if I haven't had a chance to replenish the pot, it's either there or it's not. Mm -hmm. Period, point blank. So that's how I, that's kind of some things that I have in place to make sure that I'm able to give, mm -hmm. but I'm not giving to my detriment. And I just also want to make sure that we're honoring the Black community because I think that's something that we don't talk about enough, which is, you know, how giving we are. And that is very special, I think, to our communities. Yeah, I agree. We, yeah, we, 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 we love, we love hard, you know, and we look after everybody. Mm -hmm. Even when, even when we don't love my sister be asking me for money. I am not happy with her right now. <laughs> but, oh, can I have a girl get this money and leave me alone? I hear you. I hear you. This is one right here. Uh, you already know. And we have to talk about this. Do we? <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Because I have you on the show and we got to talk about it. having unprotected sex, making single mother household. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one is really, really tough because. I heard a pastor once say that culture is okay with you doing whatever you want just don't get caught and 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 this is a no shade to single moms you do what you got to do i get it but when you think about that bottom line and being a single parent and a lot of times single parents don't have help and even if they do have help everybody else got to jump in to make sure that you're good and even a lot of us might not even have the resources and stuff like that to be able to cover that child that had a child you know so that can drain the family financially as well because here it is the, the father lord knows what he's doing and then she stuck with this child and we, we, we're not even talking about daycare the the prices on daycare is i need to open up a daycare because they can charge whatever they want because they know you got to work and then it's just this hand to job, you know, you just giving away your money. And when you said that, I said, she went there. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Because, yeah. One thing about me, it's a lot of things about me, but one thing about me, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. And I'm going to come from a place of love and caring, not from a place of judgment yeah. um, and being critical. Mm -hmm. I might be critical, but it's going to come from a good place. I'm a Virgo. Of course I'm critical. But it's always with love. And what I want to say about this is I don't think that we have been having very honest conversations about the impact. And we, I'm not... I'm not going to play with people. It's like, if you're not, if we're not ready for the conversation, I'm not about to have some long soliloquy about it because we see people are dealing with the impact in their day-to-day -day lives. They don't need me to preach to them. I'm not going to talk to till I'm blue in the face mm -hmm. about something that people are dealing with every day in real life and understand. But what I will say is that we're not being honest about what the impact is to our ability to thrive. We cannot thrive if our community continue, if men continue to create single mothers and if single mothers allow themselves to continue to become single moms. Now we gotta, now I get it because there's a part of it that I get, I'll say, because you, there's nothing that you can do after a woman has had a baby to completely prevent her from being a mom because you cannot make somebody stay there. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that we could check off the list to make sure that we're doing our due diligence. And I often see that it comes to like down to some blame, like, well, black men did this or black women did this. And it's that word accountability that nobody wants to step in and take. And for me, I'm going to always say, I think that 
I, as I'm a person who believes in radical responsibility, but I, I'm also a person who really believes in the power of men. And I think men should be the first to step up and take responsibility and accountability. And that has no bearing on the 100% accountability that women should have also in the equation for their bodies and their lives. So I would love to see us be able to have a honest conversation and look to see like what is missing, you know, like the love between men and women or the love between women who don't have their fathers present and then go out looking for that in other places and the impact that it causes generationally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love if we could just be honest about that and really communally start putting things in place to begin to combat that. Because until we do, we could be looking for help from every which way. We could be looking towards government institutions, towards reparations, towards all these things. But until we get right within ourselves, we still going to be, you know, there's it's still going to be some things that are working to our detriment. Yes. And <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to stay here long, but I just want to kind of talk about this for a second because I just did a Father's Day, uh, a Father's Day series, a daughter's perspective, and I interviewed four different women, and they talked about the impact of their father. <clears throat> and one lady, she said, one reason she believed that men abandon their children is because they lack self confidence they're not secure enough in who they are. She said, I never met a, a confident man who abandoned his child. Mm. And I, I never thought of that. I was like, oh, that's true. So it just kind of made me see things a little different because, and, and no kudos to me, thank, thanks be to God, right? But I, I could never see me, I never understood guys abandoning their child. I I, I just can't see being away from my kids. It's, it's just not in me. Like, I don't know how I can wake up every morning and like know that my child is just, I don't know. That's, that's, I don't know. Some guys probably cut from a different cloth. I don't know what they got going on, but I could never, I'm not that type. Um, but those are the types of things, <clears throat> you know, the lack of confidence mm -hmm. or maybe emotional immaturity or whatever it is. Right. We can say it is, you know, it's not an excuse, but it's a reason. And we can start to look at like, OK, how do we deal with these things mm -hmm. so that we can have less fatherless homes and have more uh, create th more thriving environments and more wealth in our communities? Because wealth is leaving our communities right with the fathers. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Because you can make a lot of money, but if all your money is going out out the window, I mean, you you're you're no different than the person who's making you know, $20,000 less, you know, a year than you are. So there's no wealth, but broken homes everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm very passionate about that. I, 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 I don't know about men who don't, who don't want to be responsible. I get frustrated with that. Uh, that's something that's close to the heart, but okay. I want to be respectful of your time, but you talked about, the seven money mistakes that can destroy your relationship. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I just, I'm gonna give you these seven, but I just want to know which one does the most damage to relationships. Okay. You said avoiding financial questions in the beginning. I love that. Fearing financial commitment and vulnerability, not planning as a unit, not combining bank accounts, not having separate accounts, not getting a prenup. Thinking marriage is the silver bullet to finances. I was like, ooh, ooh that was heavy. And don't get caught up in social media dis uh, discussions. And I love how you break things down because, and hear me when I say this, it's like you, you can't easily, it's like checking somebody, but in the most loving way. I'm like, she just be checking folks, but it's like, oh. I'm going to love. <laughs> you know, that's how I tell people, like, I'm an auntie, but I'm not the nice auntie. And when you hear something from your auntie who really, like, is there for you and really yeah. wants to see you do your best, like, you're going to listen to your auntie. That's true. So that's kind of, it's like, 
I'm so full of love, but I'm also full of correction. Mm. You know, I'm not here to let you do what you want to do. If that's what you want to do, go to another channel. Mm. This is not the place. People come here because they are really ready for the truth, but they don't want nobody preaching to them. And that's what I'm bringing. Like, I just want to talk to you. And if you are ready to hear, then I'm here to talk and help you get on the path that you truly want to be on. Mm -hmm. For sure. Which I don't know seven. Which ones you think does the most damage to relationships? What would you say? Put it back on you. Uh, okay, me, me personally. Yes, I would say avoiding financial questions in the beginning. And you, you came out the gate like that was the first one, and I was like, "This is so true." Because <laughs> and, and I love the way you broke it down. <clears throat> you you broke it down in auntie fashion. Like I'm going to give it to you. But you're going to listen to what I got to say. And you said it's and I'm just paraphrasing how we can give somebody access to our body. We can do all these things, very intimate things. But once it comes to money. Everybody is like head in the clouds. And then by the time we get into the relationship or we get married or whatever, now all of a sudden finances is a problem. But we never had the discussion. And like you said, people women don't want to come across as gold diggers. So when you talk about money, I, I know it can be a tight rope to walk, but I think that's probably the most challenging one because you're starting a relationship that way. And if you don't know though, if you don't know your spending habits, that can be the detriment to a marriage or a relationship. Mm -hmm. And especially <laughs> with women, if they're anything like me, it's like after a certain point, it's just like, okay, we go together. But you haven't even found out vital information. It's like you want to find out that vital information before you kind of find yourself looking up like, that's my man. Because <laughs> after that, it's too late. <laughs> like, yep. yes, okay? <laughs> and he comes telling you, my, my spending habits, are they suck. They're, I'm the worst. He's like, it's okay, baby. We'll figure it out. Because you're not in love. Because you didn't talk about this. Yep. And he didn't spend the rent money on the Jordans and everything. And and but you love him though. You you your your brain gone at that point. You know, the love is blind at that point. That's why I say get it early before those feelings start getting their hooks in you. Men are not quite the same. I was seeing, I saw somebody uh, um there was a conversation on social media about the man who met his fiance, his family. He was like, yeah, they're too poor. I'm I'm out of here. Men wow. can be a little bit more logical in those situations. Sometimes they'll be like, yeah, this is not for me. And that is something that I definitely applaud you guys for. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. You, because you said something, I think you said in a Reddit post about maybe a, uh, somebody bought an expensive truck or something yeah. and the lady refused to be with him. And I'm just thinking that is brilliant. We don't talk about that enough, right? don't be doing that they be letting people do whatever they want to do and just be all in love yeah. it's like no and then after they get married they're like but i never knew he was gonna be this stop playing with me yeah you mean to tell me it wasn't a single okay so to get back on track okay i'm so glad that you said that one because mm -hmm. i probably would have had to say that one but now i'm gonna say a different one which okay. is not planning as a unit this yeah. one, so the the one that you mentioned, this is the one that like, if we don't do that, if we don't have those conversations in, in the beginning, we are not creating a space for a healthy relationship, period. But if you actually have a healthy relationship, but you don't know how to manage your finances as a unit, you are going, you're crippling yourself from the perspective of building wealth. Being, having two incomes, even if it's not two incomes, being a unit, Right. Where one person is the provider or one per or one person is providing the money because both pe everybody providing something. <laughs> yeah. and where One person is providing the money and then the other person is providing other areas. That is that is a unit that has to be maintained and managed in a certain way as well. So being <laughs> mindful of what the income is looking like, what the outflows are looking like, how we're managing the accounts and what the goals are as a family. And you can have your individual goals too, but the family is what takes precedent, right? This is now family incorporated. 
And you have to act accordingly if one of your goals are, is to build wealth. Now, if one of your goals is not to build wealth, it's going to show. You're going to have a lot of stuff and no money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No assets. Mm -hmm. So this is the one that I think like for those people who are doing well and they are in healthy relationships and they, they do have loving, committed families, but they're not, they're still not thriving and building wealth. This is typically the reason. Mm -hmm. So can you, can a spender and saver exist or do they, <clears throat> like, can they be opposite or do they have to be of, do they both have to be savers or what, what is your opinion on that? Okay. So spenders should be alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The There's answer though, that, though. <laughs> right? The answer though is flexibility. Okay. If, if people are not the real, my real response is that if people are not flexible, they should be alone. Mm. Right? If you are not able to be in flow inside of the relationship, it's not going to work. The, the coupling that I typically like to see is when the man is a spender and when the woman is a saver. Because I think that that typically, not all the time, but that typically works for the for the dynamic of the relationship where, you know, as a woman, I never want to be in a situation where, you know, a man is telling me I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that and da 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 da, -da. But I love it when he says, I want to spoil you. And I'm like, OK, great. But let's. Mm -hmm. let's 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 think about this like i so now i get to appreciate the the gesture and the effort and i get to be the helper that says okay but what else could we be doing with this money i don't want i don't want my my partner to come telling me let's let's do you know i know i said i was gonna do this and this for you but i think we should do something else instead now i'm gonna be like Wow. Um, but when when he says, I want to do all I I let's do this, let's do it, I'm gonna spend this money, and then I can come and say, let's reel this in a little bit, let's be a little bit more responsible, let's let's plan the money like this, and then I can multiply whatever it is that you're bringing to me or whatever it is that we're bringing to our pot. I really like that dynamic. Mm. However, it doesn't matter if who is the spender and who is the saver, if there is flexibility in the relationship um, where you're able to hear each other and create a plan accordingly. And when you do that, my recommendation, this is why I think everybody needs to have a family account and everybody needs to have separate accounts. And you just make decisions about what to do with the money based on the goals. And then the spender can spend their money however they choose. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's... Uh... Yeah, I'm gonna have to play that one back. That is so good because it, there is something about, and I'm not putting all the responsibility on women. I'm just saying, I, I do believe that the woman who is, and I'm saying that the man shouldn't be financially competent. They should, right? But I, but I think with women, I think because women have so much influence, whether when it comes to buying a home, um, things that she liked things that she preferred if you know you're trying to look out for your wife and stuff like that you want her to have you know nice things right. and and for her to have that discipline and be like like you said what else could we be doing with this money that's powerful it really is mm -hmm. and yeah and like the the lifestyle most of the time is going to be up to the woman yep most of the time yep so if i'm looking at a house it's like i'm going to decide how low we can go based on what i'm comfortable with mm -hmm. yeah and then you your job is to oblige me <laughs> I'm just kidding, but i'm not <laughs> yeah because i believe most most men i believe most men want their their their, their wife or their significant other they want I, I believe that most men want their woman to be comfortable they want her to have the things yep. that she desire uh, but for her to have that discipline yeah. What are some effective strategies for building generational wealth? Because we hear about it a lot, right? But what are some steps or some keys uh, practically that we can do to create generational wealth? I have so many ideas about this, and I appreciate you for asking me this question. Um, one of the first things I think that we can do is focus on financial stability instead of wealth. 
focus on being stable. And I think that sometimes when we focus our when we focus on goals that are so beyond us in the moment, it kind of lets us off the hook of doing what we need to do now because we have some pie in the sky dream about what we're working towards. But if you start working on financial stability right now, some of the it will require something of you in terms of how you're making certain decisions. So that's number one. Number two. Um, going from thinking individually to thinking more communally, right? So, you know, spending money with people who look like you or spending money with people who are in your local area mm -hmm. and thinking about um, people who are, how do you spend money with people in your family? Like having money be passed around inside of your family, inside of your community, inside of your race you know, and then growing and expanding right from there, right? So, I mean, I mean, making sure that you're spending money in a way that is in alignment with your values. Mm -hmm. So if you are a person who, you know, you're a person who is of wealth and prominence in your family, instead of, you know, buying all these gifts and stuff, mm -hmm. open up those custodial accounts, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that, you know, people have the things that they need. So I'm a person where I don't buy a lot of gifts. You know, Christmas could come, birthdays could come, Mother's Day could come, Father's Day could come. I don't buy gifts, but my nephews are coming to stay with me this week for the next two weeks. And when they come, you know, I have a whole host of experiences that I want them to do and things that I want to teach them to make sure that I'm passing down a legacy, not a gift, mm. a legacy. So thinking about how I operate inside of my community and, you know, my brother has a business. Am I sharing it? Am I promoting it? Just like there are so many things that we could be doing to make sure that we are benefiting each other as a community. I have skills, you know, my am I using them to make sure that my siblings know how to build wealth? Am I using them to make sure that my cousins know how to build wealth? If you're a marketer, right? Or if you have a YouTube channel, is there somebody in your family, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, somebody that you know, who could, you could help them build a YouTube channel, help them monetize their skills, monetize their resources. So I know I said a lot of things right there, but the crux of number two is just being community minded. Mm. And that can be with your money or with your time and with your skills. Mm. Wow. That is good. Yeah. Because <laughs> you have some really good stuff. I just want to ask you all these questions because you talked about family, right? Yeah. And why is it that so many of us struggle with family supporting each other? Why does it seem like all, all your support come from strangers opposed to people that know you? Is it because they know you? <laughs> you know, I always think about the story of Jesus where nobody was, his family wasn't trying to receive him. Yeah, true. You know, and I'm like, that's that's where my mind goes, mm -hmm. right? But also, everybody isn't ready for what you're ready for. And a lot of times, the things that created you to be who you are are the very things that created your family to be a different way, you mm -hmm. know? So things impact people so differently. So I'm a saver, but the things that made me a saver made my sister a spender. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm trying to talk to her about saving, she's not trying to hear. She She's like, ma'am, can I please enjoy my life? My parents told me, you know, we grew up poor and now she's not poor anymore. And she wants to be able to live her best life. I grew up poor. I'm not poor anymore. I don't ever want to be even thinking about poor again. So I don't have no answer for you at all <laughs> in any type of, you know, substantial way. But that's just how the cookie crumbles. How about yeah. that? I know for sure. No, I appreciate it. It's just it just seems like that's always been a thing, you know. You know, and it's like you don't have to support <laughs> me with your money. You know, is there somebody that you could send my way? Is there something that you could share? Can you invite me to come speak at your church? Exactly. Yeah. Cause and like I even tell people, I'm like, look, you don't have to spend <clears throat> you don't have to spend money. You can go and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts for me. That would be great. You know, if it's something as simple as five minutes of your time. Um, shameless plug, I guess. Um, 
<laughs> Last question. How can someone build an emergency fund if they're living paycheck to paycheck? So oh, that's a I, lot of us. I started building my emergency fund when I was 10. I didn't think of it as an emergency fund, but I was in a lot of situations where there are a lot of emergencies around me. And I started realizing that I should, I should probably make sure there's some money available. And the way that I did it was literally with pennies and nickels and dimes. So my mom used to have, you know, those big pickle jars. Oh yeah. There would be pennies in them. And I would pour all the pennies out and I would count them on a regular basis to make sure I knew Okay. And I actually would have to use them. So some days when my family didn't have any money, I would go into the pickle jar, get $2 in pennies to put on the bus to go to school. Wow. So, and that was my emergency fund. And I knew it was there. I knew how much was in it. And then I started adding, and then I claimed it, right? Because nobody else wanted it because it was just pennies. Mm -hmm. So I claimed it for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I started adding to it pennies, nickels, and dimes. And occasionally dollars. And what I would do is that I would get a notebook. And at the top of the notebook, every single day, I would write down, okay, I have $10 right now. And then at the end of the day, I would write down, okay, how much do I have left? Right? So the what you want to do is don't worry about how much money you have or don't have. What you want to do, though, is focus on your money. That's it. And if you start to focus on your money, something magical will happen. You're going to realize that it's going to start to expand. Money is going to be available in places that you never knew it was available before. Now, you might be thinking, Tasha, you're crazy. But I invite you to just try it. Try it out. I have, uh, I, I always record, you know, I always take screenshots of things that my clients send me. And I remember five years ago, this is when, you know, my client... These days, my clients are saving thousands of dollars. Five years ago, they were struggling to save $200. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of my clients messaged me and she said, I was supposed to save $200 this month. I saved $500. Wow. And this is the standard. Whatever you focus on, it will begin to expand. So that is how. Don't focus on what you have. Don't focus on what you don't have. Just focus. Mm -hmm. And let that be the goal. And mm -hmm. the money will expand and then the question becomes is it going to slip through the cracks or is it going to be funneled into a savings account mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's good because there's a lot of people that's just living paycheck to paycheck <clears throat> one check throws everything off you know and and that's a common question and i wanted to get your feedback on that that's good um, one more thing i'll say mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, the, um which app do i prefer uh capital get the capital app and have it j just do the roundup rule or even just do a dollar a week save a dollar a week i call this silent saving you mm -hmm. won't notice it but at the end of the year you will have hundreds to thousands of dollars saved just because they rounded up every dollar and you saved a dollar a week or whatever it is that you if you can do five dollars a week do that Mm -hmm. But it it will, you won't even feel it, but the impact will be significant. Mm -hmm. This is where my clients do at least 30% of their savings. This is where 30% of their total goal comes from, mm -hmm. just from silent saving that they don't even feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Yeah, the silent, yeah. It's the small things because it's easy to go blow money. There's people that go to Starbucks every day you know, seven days a week, you you figure if that money was put to the side, you know. Because the thing is, people are living paycheck to paycheck, but they're actually silent spending. They just don't realize it. Mm. So if you use silent saving to combat this silent spending, <laughs> then you'll be better off. <sighs> so good. So good. Thank you so much for your time. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Give us all the good information, everything. I'm going to have everything linked up, linked up in the description, but let us know what you got going on. 
Okay, so thank you guys for listening and allowing me to be a guest with the amazing Sean today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you. You can find me on social media platforms at Goddess Stay HQ, or you can search for my name, which is Latasha Kennard, L A T A S H A K I N N A R D. And right now I'm doing intake for our Wealth From Scratch Academy. This is for people who want to be able to uh, hit their first uh, 10K or their first six figures, but they don't know where to start. So I don't care how much money you have, right? You are not helpless and you are not hopeless. You have what it takes to create the financial future that you want for yourself. So definitely come find me and thank you again for the opportunity. Oh, yeah, for sure. Brave Hearts community, you heard it here. I'm going to have everything in the description. So make sure you click those links. Make sure that uh, you have a, a email list that people can can get on as well. Uh, absolutely. So if you <laughs> find me on social media, especially over at Instagram, you'll be able to have tons of free resources. Mm. So definitely make sure that you click that link in bio. And it'll take you to my free resources. We have budget templates. We have eBooks. We have all kinds of resources, um, <clears throat> free money mindset resources. So everything that you need to get your money right from the ground up. Wow. Well, Brave Hearts community, there's no excuse for you to get your money in order after this one because she dropped so many value bombs. So make sure that you get all those resources uh, and make sure that, you, you know, if you're going to hire her or get the resources, get everything that you need to get, because we're talking about building generational wealth for our community. If you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone because you never know what people are going through. Somebody can be struggling financially and this episode could be the one that can actually give them the necessary breakthrough. If you are listening to, the, to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. By doing so, it will put you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card who doesn't like free things. This is Sean Heineman with special guest Tasha K, and we are out. Are you a content creator, YouTuber? Maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really, really good. Or maybe you said something that was really, really good. Well, enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I want to share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram Reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and let you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you.